Farming is by far the most popular method of acquiring consistent gold in Guild Wars 2. You can do it as much as you want, it's both easier and more accessible than a lot of other gold making options, and players also just find it to be more fun. In this video, I'll be giving some general tips for improving your gold farming experience and going over some of the best farms that the game has to offer, each with its own requirements, advantages, disadvantages, and optimization strategies. I'll be using wide ranges of gold per hour in this video to accurately cover the amount of gold that you can realistically expect to be earning, because account progression, farming efficiency, and price fluctuations can all cause a lot of variance in your final gold per hour when you're farming. I'll also only be covering repeatable farms in this video, so any daily meta events won't be included. Let's get started. There's a few things that are relevant no matter what farm you're doing. The first is simply to make sure that you're farming content that you enjoy playing. Guild Wars 2 is a game, and we play games to have fun. Crazy, right? Farming stuff you hate just because it makes slightly more gold per hour will do nothing other than burn you out and you'll make significantly less gold in the long run as a result. I've seen way too many people do it. Find farms that you enjoy playing and will give you decent gold per hour. Switch it up if you get bored, there's plenty of options. The farms in this video are just a good starting point to use. The next tip is to make sure that you have an appropriate build for what you're farming. For open world farms, you just need a weapon with skills that can quickly tag multiple targets at a time with a few thousand damage so that you can get loot from as many mobs as possible. Good options could be a longbow on ranger, greatsword on mesmer, shortbow on thief, or many others. Some players also prefer to use gear with defensive stats when they're farming to make sure that they can survive and tag more efficiently. No matter what farm you're doing, you'll want to make sure that you're using consumables and boosters to maximize your loot. For most farms, you'll at least want a guild boost from your guild hall's tavern, an enrichment in your ascended amulet, and both food and enhancement items that boost your magic find, like peppermint omnom berry bars and sharpening skulls. There's many other impactful boosts like birthday boosters, heroic boosters, and guild banners that you can use as well if you have them. To best increase loot with boosters, Focus first on experience boosters, then focus on magic find boosters, and then last focus on karma and gold boosters. There will be a link in the description to a more in-depth list of boosters to use while farming, because there's quite a few. If you're farming, you'll also want to make sure that you're processing your loot correctly to get the best possible yield for all the time that you've spent. For unidentified gear, always open it before you salvage, and if you don't know what salvage kits to use for each type of gear, Follow the system on screen now so that you can optimize what you receive. This diagram is also linked in the description. Once you've salvaged your gear, refine all the raw materials at a crafting station, because they'll generally be worth a fair bit more after you've refined them. Hold on to materials that you'll need in the future so that you don't have to spend gold buying them back. When you go to the trading post to start selling things, go to the right side and list them there. DO NOT INSTANT SELL THE ITEMS! Instant selling just makes players like me richer. As happy as I am to take a cut of your farming profit, I think we can both agree it's better if you keep everything that you've earned for yourself. Common materials don't generally take very long to sell once they're listed, and in the long run, you'll make significantly more gold than you would by instant selling. Last, understand how to get value out of your wallet currencies. Spirit shards can be used in various crafting recipes and material promotions in the Mystic Forge, which can make you gold from selling the result or save you gold when sourcing materials for your own needs. Unbound magic can be used to purchase magic warped bundles. Volatile magic can be used to purchase trophy or leather shipments. There will be links to public calculators for these currencies in the description. Now, onto the farms themselves. The first farm we'll be talking about is Drizzlewood Coast. The only things required to farm this map are having the corresponding chapters of Icebrood Saga unlocked, which are No Quarter and Jormag Rising. There are quite a few advantages to this farm. First, it's not timer-based, and the first half of the map is almost completely self-directed, so you don't need to start at a set time, and you don't need to rely on a commander to start running the map effectively. The first half of the map is extremely unique, and a lot of players appreciate that. It's also a fully repeatable farm. You'll be receiving a wide variety of items, including tier 2, 3, and 4 materials, like wool scraps, steel ingots, and sharp claws. Because other level 80 maps don't really drop these tiers of items, Drizzlewood Coast is the best map to farm materials for crafting Ascended Gear. It's also pretty good for gathering materials for gifts of Condensed Might and Magic, which are used to craft certain pieces of Legendary Gear. Finally, the overall value of loot that this map puts out is pretty competitive with other top farms, which is obviously one of the biggest considerations when you're farming. So how does this farm actually work? On a fresh map, you'll start by completing events and escorts that eventually lead to you taking more territory. 
you can use the map currency, War Supplies, to airdrop to areas with active events. This part of the farm is self-directed and you won't want to follow a commander. You want to participate in as many events around the map as you can. Once you've captured all the areas on the south side of the map, a fight with the meta bosses will start at Wolf's Crossing. Beating these bosses rewards you with chests and begins the most profitable part of the farm, a chain of champion cash keepers. An orange boss skull icon will appear on the map and you want to quickly locate it, airdrop as close as you can, and get there as soon as possible. These cash keepers can go down fairly quickly, so having a griffin or sky scale really helps here to make sure that you get credit for all of them, but it's not necessary. After killing the cash keeper, you'll get a few cash chests and then another one will spawn. You'll repeat this process until you kill all 10 cash keepers on the map or you run out of time. After a short delay, the north side of the map will commence. The north side plays more like a typical map meta with a series of events that are a little more sequential and you'll usually have a commander at this point that you can follow. Once you've made it to the citadel at the end of the map, you'll have another chain of events with a boss fight and more chests at the end to complete the map. The north side of the map gives a little bit lower profit than the south side, but it's still pretty decent. How to optimize your loot for Drizzlewood Coast Your loot in Drizzlewood Coast will come not only from killing mobs, completing events, and looting chests. You'll automatically get chests every 10 minutes based on how far the meta's progressed on the south side. You'll also get rewards for collecting char commendations and progressing the Glory to the Legion's achievements, much like a reward track from PvP or World vs. World. Once you've done all the Glory to the Legion's achievements once, I strongly recommend speaking to this NPC by the base camp waypoint and changing your commendations to go to the most profitable Legion. There's a link in the description to a page on the Fast Farming website that shows the profit of each Legion, because it might change in the future. While you're at this NPC, you can also purchase a small magic find boost and additional cash keys that you'll need to loot chests during the meta. The more you buy, the more expensive they get, and the price resets on a daily basis, so it's a good idea to buy them regularly in order to maintain a good quantity. The next farm we'll be talking about is Dragonfall. The only requirement for farming Dragonfall is having the corresponding Living World Season 4 episode unlocked, War Eternal. However, having the Thermal Propulsion Mastery from Living World Season 3 and the Gliding Mastery track fully upgraded from Heart of Thorns will be incredibly helpful for navigating the map without a Skyscale mount. Dragonfall has a few big advantages. The first is that the map looks pretty cool and is unique compared to some others, which a lot of players really appreciate. You also receive a bit of variety in your loot, so it's a farm that remains consistently good even when certain items fluctuate in price. It's also fully repeatable, not on a timer, and offers a very competitive gold per hour rate when you farm it efficiently. The biggest downside to Dragonfall is that you will need a map instance that is being run by a commander, and your gold per hour will depend a lot on how efficient that commander is. So what does farming Dragonfall actually look like? On a fresh map, you'll start with escorts to establish three camps in the different areas on the map. You'll then complete various events in those areas to level the camps up, getting loot along the way. Once that's finished, you'll move on to a long boss fight which rewards you with a bunch of chests, and then a champion train which will give you even more. Loot Optimization for Dragonfall Opening the chests at the end of the meta will require Mistborn Keys. Unlike the keys in Drizzlewood Coast, the number of keys that you'll receive in Dragonfall is actually pretty tight, so it's important that you participate in as many events as possible at the beginning of the meta to make sure that you'll have the most keys possible to loot every chest at the end. Additionally, you can buy account upgrades called Empowerments and Retributions from an NPC at the Pact Camp. These will permanently increase your experience and karma gained while farming in Dragonfall, so they could be a worthwhile investment if you plan to spend a lot of time here. While farming Dragonfall, you'll also accumulate Volatile Magic. This is a valuable currency that can be traded in for trophy and leather shipments, giving you even more profit. I'll link a page in the description that shows the value of the shipments so you can see how much they're worth and choose the best option. Next we have the Living World Season 4 train. This farm covers all five Living World Season 4 maps besides Dragonfall. Therefore, it's going to require the first five episodes of Living World Season 4 story to do the whole train, but you could always hop on and off if you're missing some of the episodes. There's a couple of advantages to this farm. First, you'll get more variety than you would with any other farm in this video, because you'll be hitting five different maps which each have different appearances and events that you can complete. This is what makes LS4 trains one of my favorite farms personally. This farm also has one of the highest yields of experience and karma for an open world farm once you get all of your account augmentations for the maps. This makes it especially good for players looking to make gold through legendary crafting. 
The biggest downsides are that you're going to have to own multiple episodes of Living Story to do it, it takes a sizable investment into account augmentations to maximize the output, and it has a lower liquid gold output than some of the other farms in this video, because it puts more of an emphasis on earning wallet currencies. You'll also need a commander to start running one of these before you can take part, and it can only be run at set times. Finally, while this farm is repeatable, you would have to do it on a second character to get most of the loot the second time around if you did want to do it twice. This probably won't be an issue for most players, as an individual run is over 3 hours anyway, but there's some pretty crazy people out there, so you never know. So how does this farm work? Mostly, you'll be completing the meta events in Domain of Istan, Sandswept Isles, Domain of Korna, Jahai Bluffs, and Thunderhead Peaks. In the downtime between the meta events, you'll be completing bounties and other events to get additional loot. The route this train takes can vary slightly based on the commander's preferences and what's available on the map at the time. The commander will give you directions the whole way through, so you don't need to worry about knowing the specifics. The best place to find one of these trains is the Choo Choo Alerts channel in the Overflow Trading Company Discord. You can find a link for that server in the description. Loot Optimization for LS4 Trains your loot will come from tagging mobs, completing events, and looting chests. There's no keys to worry about with this farm, which is a nice advantage over the previous two that we covered. As I already mentioned, account augmentations are huge for this farm. Unlocking the three tiers of empowerment and retribution on the various maps takes a decent amount of gold and volatile magic to do, but it will permanently increase the amount of experience and karma that you receive substantially. Like Dragonfall, this farm also generates a significant amount of value through the volatile magic that you earn. As discussed earlier, volatile magic can be converted into gold through trophy and leather shipments. Many farmers use the karma and spirit shards from this farm to craft legendaries for profit, so purchasing trophy shipments and performing tier 6 material promotions in the Mystic Forge is a convenient way for them to get their gifts of might and magic at a reduced cost. So far we've discussed three farms that require episodes of the Living World story to participate in. For players who don't have access to those, or just want another option, we have Silver Waste, which has no real requirements to do. The biggest advantages to this farm are consistency and accessibility. You don't need any expansions or Living Story episodes to access it, and there's almost always an instance of the map running. The disadvantages of Silver Waste are that the gold per hour is lower than some of the other farms in this video, and it can be pretty repetitive, so a lot of people don't like to do it for very long. How does Silver Waste work? For the majority of the farm, you'll be running a counterclockwise rotation and completing events around the red, indigo, blue, and then amber forts. For this reason, the farm is also often referred to as Reba. During this part of the farm, there's a chance for four different legendary bosses to spawn. The first time that you defeat each of them, you'll receive a central tier of mastery point, so be sure to look out for them if you need those. After the map has progressed enough, bosses will spawn at each fort and will then need to be killed. Once this is done, the Vinewrath boss will spawn on the west side of the map. Players will need to split into three groups and take turns killing mini-bosses. If done successfully, this will complete the meta and the map will move on to a chess train. Here, you can use Silverway shovels to locate lost bandit chests and then open them up using bandit skeleton keys. Once the chess train section is over, the whole process repeats. Loot Optimization for Silver Wastes The biggest thing you can do to improve the loot output from Silver Wastes is to open the bags you receive on a lower level character which gives you lower level gear and materials that are actually more valuable once the gear is salvaged. The best character to open your bags with is generally around level 55, although it can vary slightly. Having a bag opening character is not necessary by any means, but it may be worth doing if you're farming a lot of silver waste. I'll include a link in the description that tracks the value of the bags when they're opened at different levels. There's a few more situational farms I'd like to quickly mention, just in case you want a few more options to check out. Harderthorn's bobble farms can give a good yield of raw gold per hour, although they rely on weekly map reward rotations and don't give as much total gold value as other farms. The best one is the Arc Basin bobble farm. Infusion trains hit multiple metas with extremely rare infusion drops that can be worth thousands of gold, although the average profit of these trains is generally pretty low. Infusion trains are run periodically in the Overflow Trading Company Discord, link in the description. Lake Doric Leather Farms can generate a lot of leather materials if you need those, but they're relatively uncommon to see, and they give a lower gold per hour than other farms. Leviathan farming is something new added with End of Dragons, which was originally able to get some really impressive gold per hour rates, but the profit has since dropped to be more in line with other popular farms, and it could drop more in the future. 
There's a variety of solo chest and node farms with various gold per hour rates, with guides on the Fast Farming and Pew Research Center websites if solo farming is of interest to you. Links to those sites are in the description. Finally, fractal farms are a bit more difficult and involved, but can reach the highest gold per hour rates of any farms in the game for those willing to put in the extra effort. If you'd like to see a video on fractal farms and a more accessible fractal farming option for beginners, let me know and I can make a video about that in the future. So those are some of the best gold farms currently available in Guild Wars 2. Let me just reiterate one last time that the most important thing is that you do the farms you enjoy. Don't make it feel like work. If you found this video helpful, I'd appreciate you taking a second to give it a like and maybe even subscribe if you want to see more gold making videos in the future. I definitely didn't cover every farm in the game, but hopefully the ones in this video give you a few solid options to try out. Feel free to leave a comment letting me know which of these is your favorite, or if you like a different one that wasn't covered in the video. Or if you just like buying gold with gems and still made it through the whole video for some reason. Thanks for watching.